Here we are with another episode of the High Ground, powered by Premier Companies. Hey, Sal, how's it going? It's doing great. I figured it was. I think I'm going to start <laughs> saying, Sal, how am I doing? Because you're, I already know how you're doing. You're great every time. Another so. glorious day at Premier Ag. Isn't it? Isn't it? Um, and we've got Glenn in studio again. So one of our favorite guests, uh, Glenn Longaball. How are you this morning, Glenn? I'm doing great. Thank you. Good deal. So we've got you in. We're going to talk about uh, all things agronomy like we always do while you're here. But we're kicking you off here. Your question of the day today, Glenn, is... What is your definition of success? Hmm. <clears throat> context. Can you give me some context? Are we talking about <laughs> deer hunting? Or are we talking about <clears throat> um, let's go with what your farming? Pa- are we talking about agronomy or your first passion? <clears throat> deer hunting. Yeah. So then um, I, I, I would have to admit that I'm I'm a counter man. I I you know I'm looking for inches and and uh, I mean yeah you like to have a good time. And everybody likes to kill a deer or kill an antelope or whatever it is you're pursuing. Uh, but to me, it probably is more about, um, you know, if it comes too easy, if you kill something the first day on a hunt and it comes too easy, it there you, you miss something out of it, right? <clears throat> you can kill a small critter at the end of a hunt. And it's oftentimes sweeter <laughs> after you've scratched and clawed and, and gotten worn out. Uh, it's oftentimes sweeter than killing a really big one right out of the gate, right? That's why you make it so hard. I mean, you, you're the one that put a zip line across. What river was that so you could yeah. <clears throat> zip line out to the island? Well, I can't disclose that because okay. now you've already, shown, you've already told me there's too many listeners. And somebody will go pilfer my my uh, my trolley and, and cause me to have an accident. See, right now the it's on the Skillet Fork River, and the Skillet's really low right now. So uh, <clears throat> last week I did run over there one evening. I take Donna with me, so if it fails, I have somebody to call the ambulance or, you know, collect the pieces. But um, <laughs> he made a zip line to get to his. <laughs> yeah, so so this trolley, this this wire, this cable is is about three hundred feet long, and it's not quite that long tree to tree. But when I get on the trolley in the middle of the skillet fork, I'm probably thirty feet over the bottom of the <laughs> the skillet, and it's only about this. You know, it's only. Right now, about <laughs> sort of so, like sort six, of like solid ground, probably right at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Six <laughs> six inches of water is probably not going to break your fall, but what it would do is it would probably drown you when you lay there unconscious because you've just fallen thirty feet, <laughs> got to fall on your back. <laughs> so, well, that's the other thing is I've I, I do clip into a piece of uh, super blue, you know that. Um, synthetic rope. I've got a synthetic rope that I pull myself across uh-huh. with because you can't hardly reach up and grab the cable. And and get across. But. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. I bought a hog to have something in the freezer, so I didn't. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't repel yeah, or so, a zip line. <laughs> yeah, so so this particular side, you know, I, I I hunt the far side of the skillet fork from from what I call the near side or the east side, and that way I've got the prevailing wind in my favor. And I put this this cable up because I was always getting shut out. Right about the time it got perfect, um, you'd get a big rainfall event or something. You couldn't wait it. And, um, and, and so <clears throat> I put this cable up and then build a trolley that you set on that works off of two little, uh, you n- are an nylon, industrial little n- nylon <laughs> pulleys. <laughs> and basically you pull yourself across real, real slow. And when I get to the far side and I step off on the ground, I'm about 10 feet from my tree. And so the, what it affords me, which is really cool is you can insert yourself and extract yourself without them ever knowing you're there, right? So you can hunt a bedding area, which is hard to do on white-tailed deer, right? I can hunt a bedding area and insert myself. And you've not stepped on one stick to snap or anything. Uh, I'll clear that path out to the tree. Uh, in fact, that's the first thing I did. When I got off the line, it's like there's little sticks and twigs everywhere. I just take my feet and rake it back and, and break off anything that I'm going to touch on the way in. And I keep it kind of so that they don't go around that side of the tree. It's it's the most unbelievable funnel I've ever hunted, and and, uh, and it's a great time. That's what you can Good. do when you have that much nervous energy that you've got to get rid of right. all the time. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Well, it didn't happen. You know, this didn't happen overnight. I found this probably 15 years ago, 20 years ago. The biggest deer I ever shot ran at me, and I had to shoot him, keep him from running over me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and I... I, I disagree with you. I'm as proud of that deer as I <laughs> there you And go. I was only in the woods probably 10 minutes. Yep, so, yep, yep. so I felt like that was a win, but I don't like being out in the cold. So I was, yep, yep. I was loading it and going. So sure. if I truck can't, was still warm. <laughs> if I can't shoot them in the yard or get a backhoe or loader tractor to it, I don't want to mess with it. I put several through the front of my trucks. I get no satisfaction out of those. Yeah. None. Yep. yep. None. Yeah, you hate to see those. <laughs> yeah. I, hate, I hate to see them hit. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. So. But, uh, 
Sal, oh. what's your definition of success? Uh, of success, it's kind of. I guess I'll go with, kind of with work. I guess and kind of the win-win situation. We had to talk about that this morning. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, autonomous sprayers and and is this something that the grower benefits from? That Premier Ag benefits from? Does you know uh, how does that work together? And that's how we kind of go to market at Premier Ag. Is just, is uh, you know don't believe in a zero sum. Believe in making more and. Uh, that's not a canned answer. It just feels better whenever, you know, the grower wins, we win, and uh, we return some to our shareholders. So cool. easy peasy. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I hate to knock you off that fence you're riding on. but that, <laughs> so, <laughs> not, It's not, not a zip line or anything. Well, that's true. That's true. No, I think uh, I think my definition of success was has always been, you know, obviously we have some – we have some selfish reasons why we want to be successful and things that we want to do. But um, if I think success is is having someone say to you, hey, I appreciate what you did for me. I appreciate a door you opened for me or a piece of advice you gave me. Or um, So I, I think at some point in time, being a mentor and or uh, being a positive influence on someone is uh, would That's be good. my definition of success. So That's well done. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You definitely got the most exciting story of success, though, with the <clears throat> zip line 30 feet above the river. Yep, yep, yep. We, well, got, I mean, we, I, we I, always I, let him go first, <laughs> and he always has better stuff than we've got. So. Well, I always ask you to put context on it, right, every time. And, <laughs> That's true. And, and you, don't, you, you always want to go for the coon crap or the the, the most obscure. <laughs> to right? the cans. It's, it's, never, it's never around – you know, my professional role, it's always these obscure things. It's what you, you want me to elaborate on. So, Well, let's bring it back to your professional role. So Absolutely. let's talk about um, the, our latest uh, pathogen, tar spot yeah. in corn. So we're just going to do like Ryan says, and tar spot, go. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, so... Yeah, so tar spot is, um, you know, it's, it's a disease that we've had now in Indiana for probably... Uh, half dozen years or so, and um, uh, it's native to Central America, and um, and yet it's right at home here in the in the Central Corn Belt. And you would think that um, you know it need warmer climates, but it it thrives in this climate. Some question: it, How did how to get here and just show up in the last? Half a dozen years. Uh, I mean, you think about it. This is a world economy, right? You guys have listeners probably in South America, and we trade we trade commodities all over the world. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's amazing to me that APHIS, you know, keeps up and and keeps pests and pathogens at bay as well as they do, right? Because I mean, you hmm. think about our grain and where it ends up; it is all over the world. So, so explain what you just said to our readers. What did you just say? Yeah, so the folks that look after, right? So when you go through customs, <clears throat> when you leave the country or you come into the country and they ask you if you have any agricultural products, right? And and you're like, no, I don't have any agricultural products. Well, But yeah, yet you got a banana in your... You got a banana yeah. in your suitcase <laughs> or in your carry-on. <laughs> uh, you know, you could <laughs> potentially be carrying a pathogen or an insect or, or some kind of critter that... In, in a different environment could become epidemic or become, sure. uh, you know, a really noxious pest, right? And so we have agencies that look after that in the U.S. and, and other places in the world hmm. uh, try to keep that at a minimum, right? I got caught one time, I say caught, um, you know, I came back from Africa on a bow hunt, right? Because you guys know I'm passionate about bow hunting and and love to chase critters and, and stick arrows through poor defenseless critters all over the country if I can. And the world, apparently. <clears throat> yeah. And um, uh, one year we came back, and and really we had nothing to declare, right? We were on our best behavior. And yet in my quiver was a broken arrow from a critter that I had shot that still had blood on it. And oh. They, they, really? They recognized that right quick. And, of course, you know, they confiscated the arrow, and that was fine. It was not a big I mean, it was a broken arrow. But, um, uh, yeah, that, that tells you that we have dedicated men and women that are out there trying to ensure that we don't bring, you know, some obscure disease into this country. Wow, right? okay. So, so we don't know, but yet there's a lot of different ways it could have got up here. Absolutely. And uh, probably, you know, it probably came, um, <clears throat> you know, we do, you know, we do breeding work in South America just like yeah. South Americans. I actually uh, have a plot on my farm um, it, it's a company that bought FFR. You know, you remember that mm -hmm. site up there by Lafayette? 
and it's called Agribull, and they do testing for South American seed companies. It's their winter production, which is our summer production, and they come out and do, um, you know, they rent base cut packet plots, so they'll put a couple, uh, you know, maybe a thousand varieties out there, 16 half foot rows, and um, uh, basically they come in and harvest it with a plot combine. They do all the planting, all the harvesting. Mm. A lot of times I'll do the weed control, but... Um, yeah, that's it, it's possible that it could have came through something like that. But the the epicenter was up there in that um, oh it'd be that irrigated area of southwestern Michigan and northwestern really? Indiana. That's kind of where it started, if you if you remember, and um, and it blew up really quickly there. And it does overwinter here, and and um, and yet we in southern Indiana have been a bit unscathed, right? And I think that's possibly because. We've had other pathogens like southern rust uh, for some time, right? In 2016, 2017, mm-hmm. we had some really uh, bad epidemics of southern rust that changed our growers' behavior, right? We like to believe it's because we did a better job of consulting, and um, and, and, and yet it probably um, – Ultimately, was the fact that there were some huge uh, yield losses in those years because of southern rust. That changed our behavior and how we treat uh, corn uh, crops with fungicide. Mm. And and because we are treating for southern rust, it has mitigated our losses to tar spot. The tar spot, you know, if tar spot came in earlier, I'm telling you, it would be uh, without question our worst. Uh, pathogen here, right? It, it, fortunately, even though it overwinters here and has the ability to infect earlier, it doesn't seem like it normally comes in until corn gets into the R stages, right? And we're, typically we're at R1, R2 before you see any lesions. And um, uh, and so consequently, after it goes through a life cycle, right, it's a polycyclic disease, which means it goes through multi-cycles per year, just like a lot of our other diseases do. Um uh, this polycyclic disease has a longer latent period, right? In other words, that time from infection to uh, actually seeing the the vegetative structure, in this case it's called a stromata, it's like a little black raised spot, right? The it's symptoms. Like, yeah, until yeah. you, you see the symptoms is a little longer window than it is, say, with like southern rust. How long is that? Yeah, it's it's typically, I, I, can't, you know, I should know that, but it's 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 more like three weeks, right? Did I do it? I can't you get it. it. You did it? Yep, I you can't did tell it. you the actual latent period. Let me wait. Right. Mark that down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Glenn, 76,000. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to tell you. One. Yeah, well, I don't want <laughs> – you, you got a lot of listeners. I don't – if it's if it's 18 days or 22 days or whatever, yeah. but I think it's about three weeks. Or a lot of diseases, um, you know, we're talking about northern or GLS or, or southern, uh, oftentimes, you know, it's a fairly, fairly quick period, hmm. right? It can be as little as – 12 to 14 days, right? Okay. So, so this has a little longer latent period. Um, but, man, I'm telling you, when it, it must be an incredibly prolific sporulator because, you know, like with GLS, it takes multiple generations oftentimes to actually predispose the plant. With tar spot, right, the, the initial infection makes a few black, you know, uh, bumps on the on the plant right these yeah. little fruiting structures the subsequent generation completely predisposes the plant right so so you see a few spots out there and you're like oh it's good we you know we, we've got this under control maybe maybe not right if it sporulated and the and the next infection has already set up housekeeping um it, it will it will probably predispose that plant just almost overnight. So I've shown pictures uh, in the wintertime from uh, Darcy to Linko, right, where it shows um, corn that looks like it's got a few infections on it, you know, like the last week of September, and by the first week of October, it is completely and totally dead, right? You know, you go from green to a completely necrotic plant in in less than than two weeks, right? So it's uh, it, it it has the potential to be a, a terrible disease for us. Again, we have done a great job of managing because we are sensitive to southern rust, right? And I'm not convinced that um, <clears throat> every every manufacturer is is um, uh, making the right recommendations, right? So so if you look at BSS recommendations versus Bayer's recommendations versus Syngenta's recommendations, 
um, versus Darcy Falenko's recommendations, right? There's this discrepancy of when and how to treat these diseases. And it's because we don't, uh, you know, it's not in a vacuum. Oftentimes in, in the real world, we're down here treating not just southern rust or not just tar spot. We also have physoderma. We have gray leaf spot, right? We have northern. We have all these other, we have this plethora of disease that we're trying to mitigate. And so that changes the timing versus a, uh, you know, a Dr. Tlinko up at Purdue that is in intentionally trying to encourage tar spot. So she plants later, mm. right? And because and she wants as much infection as she possibly can. And by the way, we need that, right? That's, that's why academics are academics, right? We need her to, to figure out how to get the best control, what are the best products. But in doing that, she basically farms differently than the way we would farm out here. She self-selects for tar spot. Almost. Absolutely. Absolutely. Boy, that's good. You like two? Is that's that a great. two? That's Yeah, wow. put down another, another mark. Wow. Yeah, put down Man. another mark. <clears throat> Why don't you just take the rest of the day off? I feel like I've <laughs> done so. so, you know, I, and, and maybe I've added to the confusion, right? I don't feel like my recommendation has changed, and so there's a fair amount of pride here, right? I, I oftentimes do change my opinions, right, because I feel like – um, you know, we don't know everything about agronomy, and I certainly don't know everything about agronomy. And and occasionally there is um, new evidence brought to light that that suggests that maybe we haven't been managing right. But but we haven't really changed our story. Um, you know, even even you, know, you look back when I worked for Syngenta, I don't think my um, you know my my story of when we should probably make fungicide uh, amendments has changed much. Right. So we have often. Uh, encourage growers to make a V stage application followed by an R stage application, right? And that R stage application, we have been backing that up a little bit as opposed to R1. We're encouraging growers to wait maybe till R2, R2.5, maybe even R3 to ensure that it lasts long enough to, to get you to physiological maturity. And, um, and so maybe I've added to the confusion because, you know, if you start at R1 and you work this thing forward, right, R1 really, Ryan, should be probably R0, right? R1 is silking. R1 is about halfway through a plant's life cycle, right? So at R1, the physiological maturity, you're talking eight and a half to nine weeks, right? And, you know, a lot of times we're talking days, and I think that's another thing that makes it confusing. So... Um, you know, maybe we should work this backward, right? So if it's eight and a half to nine weeks to physiological maturity, and we know that if you can get corn to within two weeks of physiological maturity, there's little or no appreciable yield loss, even if a disease sets up housekeeping, right? And the reason being is at two weeks of physiological maturity, right, what we would call a full dented uh, ear, at that time, you've only got about 5% of your biomass is still going to be a accumulated, right? And so if, even if the corn was killed dead or in a mackerel at that stage, the worst it could probably uh, get hit is 5%, mm. and probably it's going gonna, it's gonna to partition or reallocate photosynthate from other parts of the plant to actually fill the ear. So you're, it's still mitigated, right? It's probably only 25 mm. or 2%, right? So that gets us to, let's say, seven weeks. And when you consider that these top tier fungicides that we're using today, right? And I don't want to leave anybody out. So if it's Syngenta, it's probably going to be a Triva Pro or a or a Miravus. If it's the the BASF folks, right? They they've got a great product called Veltima. If we're talking about Bayer, you know, it's a Delaro Complete. These top shelf fungicide products, right? These top tier products. Um, they don't just last a couple of weeks, right? It's not like chlorothranil that you used yeah. early in your career, right? That, that lasted till the next rainfall event. These products are typically uh, good for three to four weeks, mm. right? So if we know we're good two weeks from that, you know, physiological maturity range, and we know that fungicides last three to four weeks, right? That puts us, that, that, that gives us some uh, clue as to when we need to make that second fungicide application to get us to physiologic maturity with little or no appreciable yield loss, right? And that would be three weeks. So okay. what is three weeks? Well, at R1 is silking, right? That'd be like zero. Mm -hmm. R2 is blister. That's typically seven to 10 days down the road. R3 is milk. That's another week, right? So now we're talking two and a half weeks. We needed to get to three weeks. Um, dough is about... Uh, two weeks past blister, right? And so it's somewhere between milk and dough. And so if we can make um, 
R2.5, R3 applications, our likelihood of getting pinched by either Southern Rust or uh, Tar Spot is greatly reduced. Now, you're probably saying, but hey, man, when we get to flowering, we oftentimes have disease. We do, right? But those diseases are typically pretty easily controlled even without using top-tier products. But if we do use top-tier products or we'll use mid-tier products, if we'll make V-stage applications, right? Now I'm not talking about V4, you know, little teeny tiny corn. But if we'll wait until the corn gets into grand growth, which we're oftentimes making uh, nutritional amendments and that sort of thing, those applications can easily get you to, um, to flowering with little or no disease. And you're probably saying, well, how is that possible? I thought they only last three weeks. Well, they do only last three to four weeks. But the beauty is when you control disease early, when it's setting up housekeeping, things like Northern and Great Leaf Spot, um, they make a jump, right? They, they have been living, overwintering on the residue as a saprophyte, which means that they're living on decayed material. When they make the jump onto the plant, right, <clears throat> they are not very robust. And so if you can control them when they make that initial leap onto the plant, then you have made a huge impact on the subsequent generations, right? And you break so, the life cycle. Yes, you you break the life cycle and you make it start over and it works from the bottom to the top. And hmm. so that's why these V-stage applications are so effective, right? Whether we're talking about V6, V7, V8, making applications at that time when it looks like there's little or no disease still have a profound impact on when those diseases come in. And if they don't come in at R1, right, when you make a V-stage application, most of the time you get out there at R1, the plant is just spotless. So do you need to make an R1 application? Nope. And then you can delay it to R2, R2.5, R3, and then you have little or no chance of losing yield. So the strategy, uh, though it sounds really complex, is, is very forgiving, right? <laughs> I mean, whether you make it this date or next week, it probably uh, is, is going to be, um, uh, there's probably a fair amount of luck involved, right? Because the fungicides are, are pretty effective and um, uh, diseases, right? We, we don't do a very good job of predicting when they're going to happen. But if you go at this prophylactically and make multiple applications, typically two applications, I think you're, you're always... Uh, in, in our part of the world, right, we've talked about raising big corn on purpose, not accidentally yeah. raising, you know, 260 bushel corn, but I'm talking about raising corn, uh, you know, big corn crops on purpose, making two fungicide applications is almost table stakes, and it really relieves a lot of risk, right? It's, it's really about risk management, because if you think about what we have, I mean, the growers that don't, or the, the listeners that don't farm, I probably have no appreciation for the amount of money that a farmer has invested per acre. Go ahead. This is a good time to, so a little circle back to this, uh, the prescription, but go ahead and kind of tell them how much is out there. I mean, when you're talking about risk, risk avoidance to try to yeah. protect your crop. And like you said, not get pinched at the end. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Which, so, so if you're fertilizing a crop and you're paying, uh, you know, um, a decent rent to your landlords and you're putting on crop protection products to protect that crop and you're putting on nitrogen, um, <clears throat> it, it is easy for a grower to get in excess of $1,000 an acre, right, Yeah. In, in that crop. I mean, it is, it, it is very easy. In fact, I would say the majority of acres today are, are have more than $1,000 gross tied up invested in that crop. And you're saying, well, gee, you know, you're raising 250 bushel corn that may be true, but not every acre is 250 bushel corn. And the other thing is, you know, I made a comment to you, you know, Sal's my boss, right? Just like your Sal's boss. I think that's, that's, how, that's how this works. I told him the other day, he's like, well, I have lost, um, uh, if, if I thought I was going to have any sovereignty this year because I had this great big crop, and, you know, any autonomy that has gone away, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to work forever because that crop that was, that was uh, so big, uh, has lost about, you know, 25% of its value from this summer, right? And, you know, $4 corn, it takes, you know, at $4 corn, it takes 250 bushel corn 
to break to make, even. Yeah, to break even or make any money at all. Well, we hate it that your hands are tied. But yeah. That's, <laughs> that's kind of a weird feeling. Talk about that <laughs> definition of success. You're right. Yeah. This is it. <laughs> right. Yeah. To have an agronomist that can't go anywhere. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's it's obviously not quite that ugly, right? We, we all... Um, you know, farmers like to sandbag like everybody else, right? Because there's nothing worse than getting your hopes up. And, and that's kind of what happened, yeah. right? You you had $6 corn, a big part of the summer. Uh, looks like, you know, we started getting rainfall. It's like, hey, we're going to have a crop, and maybe the central corn belt's not. Um, and then, uh, of course, the central corn belt's crop ends up being better, and they keep revising. In fact, I think there's a WASDE report. We're going to talk today. about that yeah. later. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and they'll I'm sure they'll beat it up a little bit more. But... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, you can't get off on commodities. And you talk about agronomy, and um, uh, you know, I don't think our our story here at Premier or my story has changed on the timings. But I know it's difficult for um, it's difficult for me, and I think it's difficult for a lot of people to to if we're making a diagram or a schematic of when to make applications. Uh, this is all temporal, right? It's it's hard to picture time. I don't want to mm-hmm. get into a <laughs> Think about our vice president and the significance of time. And the- oh my gosh, <laughs> that'll make the comments. If we didn't, if we weren't going to get any comments, now we'll get some. Better act like I didn't hear it. Yeah, I'm just going to glaze over. Yeah, so we won't. We won't go into that. Uh, what what do time. they call that? The passage of time is pretty important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it is hard. You know, we think about um, these applications. It's not like oh, we have the disease. We're going to make the application. We cured it. Now it's good, right? That was that was the way we managed. Uh, with IPM, and we still try to practice IPM as best we can. <clears throat> but when you consider that when you see... IPM is integrated pest management, meaning that you see the problem before you treat it. That's correct, right. Ooh, yeah, great. outstanding, Ryan. Ryan, Give won. yourself half a point for that because you're friends with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, you know, it's not that we don't like to follow integrated pest management, but if we wait until we see the lesions... Because this crop is so valuable and we're no longer trying to raise 150 bushel corn, right? We're trying to raise 250 bushel corn on purpose. You, you can't very well do that by waiting every time until, uh, by the way, you, you wait on some pathogens until you see the, uh, the, the fruiting bodies. They've already sporulated and you now have a full-blown infection, right? And Can I stop you for just a minute? Back sure. up. Just a, uh, when you said that the, the yield on tar spot you can mitigate it by making your fungicide pass late enough. Um, so for my ignorance and and hopefully somebody out there that's listed doesn't know the answer to this either, you're talking about, though, ear fill and all that. So what about stalk integrity that goes along with these kind of diseases? Obviously, there can be there can be yield loss there at some point in time. So two weeks out from phys- physiological maturity may not save the stalk. Am I right? Um, Am I asking that correctly? I mean, yes, I, I think I, I think I see where you're going with this. By the way, have you been snooping around on my phone? Because just yesterday, uh, I made a diagnosis. Right, <clears throat> in 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 the premier companies, I've got a uh, an account rep that has had a grower with corn that has fallen down in spots. Right, and um, the way you described it, it's like, yeah, you've just got crown rot, and um, I thought it was kind of unusual because it's a dry spring. And this area had been fairly dry, and it's like, you know, what's the likelihood that crown rot would be that bad? But, you know, maybe he's got really high populations. Maybe these are springs or wet areas. And um, uh, yesterday he sent me some photographs of it. And very quickly, you know, when, it, I, when I expanded the picture, it's like, oh, my word, right? And he had stock split too. And it, there was some crown rot there, obviously, but that wasn't the, the that was not the the primary culprit. The primary culprit was tar spot, wow. right? When you you could see the stromata, these black spots, even on necrotic, you know, dead leaves out in a cornfield, you can see it today. In fact, it's everywhere, right? So so our our strategy of protecting these plants, you know, through uh, the majority of grain fill was absolutely effective. But it doesn't it doesn't eliminate the disease, right? The the disease still comes in. It's just coming in so late that it no longer impacts yield, and hopefully it's late enough that it doesn't impact standability. So to your point, Ryan, this this particular grower had pockets in the field that were just uh, totally necrotic and completely, um, uh, you know, completely lodged, right? In other words, the, the plants had broken, and part of that was diplodia, but a big part of it was just the fact that, that um, 
uh, tar spot had come in, predisposed the plants, you know, killed them prematurely. That plant then tries to compensate, right? Because it was designed to, to fill that ear, right? That's how it proliferates or that's how it um, creates the next generation is by creating viable seed. You kill a plant off prematurely, you kill the vegetation off prematurely, it tries to do everything possible, right? Sacrificing standability because, hmm. um, you know, that's not the design, right? No. We, we select for standability, but uh, that's not what it was designed. It was designed to create seed. So now we've got it. It's out there. It's on the residue. What do you want to do with the residue? What is our plan now? Do we rotate out for a year or two? Do we work? We obviously do we work it? We bury it down? Yeah. What do you, that, what's your recommendation? Yeah. So if if you're going to go corn on corn, then absolutely um, working that residue down will have will have it will help mitigate some of the inoculum. Right. When we think about the disease triangle, there's three things. Right. It takes it takes. Uh, you know, favorable environmental conditions, right? It takes a susceptible host, right? And the third thing it takes is inoculum, right? And 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 so when you make, um, uh, you know, these tillage passes, right? When you work the residue into the ground, you're trying to reduce the inoculum. You don't eliminate the inoculum, right? But you do reduce it. So in our part of the world, we do a lot of um, – conservation tillage and um you know we're trying to hold the soil so we're we're not encouraging people to make um you know more tillage passes and so in that case what you would do is you would uh, rotate to soybeans because it doesn't infect soybeans and hope that uh, during that time that you know that it it can't over you know it can't make it through two uh, seasons as a saprophyte right but generally, so let's, we're still going back to your prescription, but generally we are in that rotation. I mean, we do have a lot of corn on corn, particularly out yep. in the western part of our territory, but generally we are in a corn soybean rotation, but we still see this. Is that oh, because it, it blows in once the... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it's not like southern rust, right? Southern rust <clears throat> overwinters in the south, right? And, and then it blows up here with storms. This overwinters here, just like grazing spot, just like uh, northern, just like physoderma, the difference would be that it typically uh, sets up housekeeping a little later in the year, right? And so if it came in earlier, I'm, I'm telling you, we would probably have to change our strategy. But, wow. but the way we're uh, using fungicides today, uh, we're doing a pretty decent job on, on tar spot. We haven't had anybody... Um, if they made, if, if they've kind of followed this regime of making a B stage application followed by a delayed R application, uh, you know, last year, uh, one of the things that changed was we were so dry during the V, what, when we normally make V stage applications, we were so dry that some folks didn't make those applications, right? Yep. And then when we got to R1, they did have gray, they did have northern they did have physoderma and so so they couldn't delay that r stage application they had to make an r1 and then they had to turn around yep. and come right back at r4 you know which normally is pretty late but they had to make a second application for fear of, of tar spot or southern rust setting up housekeeping and so <clears throat> i'd rather not lose any of that uh, even though the majority of it is on the bottom of the plant i'd rather not lose any photosynthetic capacity early on right because um, you know, I say early on, I'd, I, when we get to R, the R stages, I'd love to have a perfectly clean plant yep. at that time if I could. So which vegetative stage to make the uh, early application? V8, V9, V10? <clears throat> yeah, anywhere from V6 to V10. Okay. Obviously, we want to follow label restrictions. Um, th there are some restrictions because you can um, – oftentimes it's not the fungicide that can cause arrested ear syndrome. It's the adjuvants that we use with it. But, yeah. you know, there's listeners here that don't know <laughs> whether their, um, their adjuvant system contains known phenolethoxylates or these NPEs that often are associated with arrested ear syndrome. Right. So, so, um, uh, yeah, you need to f follow label instructions. Um, I can tell you that it's typically not the fungicide itself that causes arrested ear syndrome or seed production, which they, you know, in seed production, they'll run fungicides, uh, not weekly, but but probably every couple of weeks, they'll run a fungicide across mm. it, trying to, because trying to, those are typically inbred lines, right? Yep. The, the offspring are, are, you know, have a lot of heterozygosity, right? They're, um, they have a lot of what we call hybrid vigor, but the inbred lines in production seed, um, are, are, you know, they're inbreds, right? They, they don't have a lot of vigor. Yeah. Right? 
They have an and absence we, of hybrid vigor. And we use Master Lock. That's one of the that's the product we use. So in the vegetative stage, then come back and hopefully that gets us to R two and a half to R three. Absolutely. With a top tier yep. fungicide to finish out. Absolutely. And like I said, there are some wonderful fungicides, right? They um, uh, you know, it wasn't that many years ago that we were reliant on um, you know, kind of this first generation triazoles and and strabillion products. Til yeah, basically propiconazole, yeah, till. And um, today we have kind of second generation triazoles and and even this azole from from BASF uh, is is really really a wonderful product, and great addition, and and that's you know that and genetic gain and doing a better job of feeding plants and being conscious of of in season nutrition, all those things together have made us grow really big crops on purpose, right? Yeah. That's all, right. all I've got. That's all I've got. Very good. All right. Thank you, fellas. No, thank you very much. We appreciate having you and uh, all good information for sure. It's my so. pleasure. Okay. Well, that's another episode of The High Ground, powered by our Premier Companies. If you uh, like what you see, please uh, subscribe to the channel and uh, hit that like button. We'll see you next round. Thank you. <laughs>